Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Ariel Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. Brooklyn-born, The Rockaways, NYU, lingerie salesman? Nah, insurance, philanthropist, community leader. That's the story of the Cronish brothers. And I have one of the Cronish brothers who, to tell the story of him and his brother, Herb Paul Cronish. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mike. It's nice to have you here. So tell me about your father's family when they came to America. My dad came with his father when he was six years old. Now, where did they come from? My father used to say it was just outside of Vienna. As it turned out, it was part of when the maps kept on changing. It wound up being Russian area, whatever. We ultimately wanted to go back there because my son, Ben, when he was old enough, wanted to go to Europe and wanted to see where Papa Ben lived when he was born. So what did Grandpa do? Grandpa was a tailor on the east side, sweetest little man. He used to come and visit us in Brooklyn on the Culver Line subway, and he'd bring two bags of chocolate kisses for Herb and me. Okay, so let's talk about Grandpa. So he came over as a tailor. Any idea where he lived originally when on they the came over? the Lower East Side. Uh, that's where Dad lived with him. He had uh, uh, two or three brothers, two I can remember very clearly and about three or four sisters. My father was the first one that Grandma had that was a live child. She gave birth to, still born as a result of that. It catered to the kind of attitude she had towards my father, which was just for her. Okay, his father was a tailor. Sure. Tell me about his growing up. Well, my dad was taken out of high school at age 14 to go and help the family survive to get a job. That lasted a number of years until he got old enough by age-wise to qualify as somebody to go to college. He went to NYU night school for four years. What was he doing during the day? Uh, he worked wherever he could get a job. I'm not sure exactly where, where he lived, but I know that their apartment was in a building that you walked up a big flight of stairs to get to his apartment. And uh, he also worked in a notion store uh, and that's where he met my mother, ultimately. And uh, that was a very interesting situation because the owner of that store, Mrs. Feinstein, had a child that she constantly had to get him out of jail because he was always doing something crazy. And one night, my father came home late from night school, and my grandmother had him locked out of the house because he came home late. 
He aptly told Mrs. Feinstein the next day what happened to him. She said, oh, I see. She went, she literally had legs that I didn't know how she could walk, but she went and walked up that stairway, knocked on the door, my grandmother came to the door, and she introduced herself and said, you have a nerve to knock your, lock your son out of a house because he came home late from either school and or work? And she told the story about what she does with her son. She says, this is such a wonderful human being. Right, because she was going to the jail for her son. And she says, you should be ashamed of yourself to do this kind of thing to a boy like this who all he wanted to do was to better himself and take care of his family. So what happened was, as you said to me, he graduated college, but then had to go back to Take his regents counts because high school. Because he had taken off and worked. Very unusual. So now tell me about your mother's side. Okay, my mother had a great family. That was the Weisbard family. They were crazy nuts, but wonderful. Everything that... When did they come over, the Weisbard family? uh, I believe all of them were born in the States. Uh, And it was a large family of brothers, sisters, and... They could be crazy nuts with what their personalities would be, but if any one of them were in trouble, everybody was there at the same time. Now, what did Grandpa Weisbrod do? We, we know that your father's father was a tailor. Yeah. Grandpa Weisbrod was catered to by his children. He was a very distinguished old man, beautiful little goatee, and a cane with a silver handle. They lived in Brooklyn, one block away from us. We were on East 3rd Street. They were on East... Second Street. But what, what did Grandpa, the, the, the guy with the, the cane, do for a living? I never knew what he did, if he ever did anything. I think he was just taken care of by his children. Okay, tell me about your mother. My mother was a very special lady. She actually never finished high school. She was the most creative woman, and we know this by not only because growing up with her, but growing up later and seeing the things that we could appreciate what she did. She could go into a junk store, take a look at something over here, and she said, these two things would be together, be great. So some of the most beautiful pieces of either artwork or furniture that we have in our apartment to this day was stuff that my mother put together. She was incredible. She never understood how great that was. She was an outstanding personality could still see her sitting at that piano playing and singing. When I say singing, she comes from a family of great singers. The world-renowned cantor Yusla Rosenblatt was her great uncle. Yeah, tell me about Yusla Rosenblatt, because it's an interesting story, because he was an Orthodox rabbi. Yes, indeed. On 114th Street in New York was his congregation. He also was involved in the newspaper business on the Forwitz newspaper. He was there when that paper went into bankruptcy, and they wanted him to declare bankruptcy, which he would not do. He was offered to come to the Chicago Opera House to sing, but wouldn't do that because he'd have to sing either on Shabbos or Friday night, and they wanted him to shave his beard, and he wouldn't do that. He ultimately wound up in Israel and died there, penniless as far as that was concerned. What was his relationship with your mother? He was a great uncle. Great uncle. Yeah. And so he was a great, great uncle for us. And that Rosenblatt family always connected with us from the Weisbard side of the family. Uh, One of the sons of Cantor Rosenblatt married Naomi and me. He was the chief rabbi in Baltimore of a major, uh, I think, conservative congregation in Baltimore. So you were telling me that Pop met Mom in a notion store. What was this? What's the story about that? My mother worked there during the day. My father would come in, whether before classes or or after, whatever the case may be. Was this uh, in high school or in college? No, no. This was he was ready in college. He was a mature adult working, Uh, and uh, he was doing some accounting work at that point in time. That was his major in college, Uh, and uh, I don't know all of the obviously pick up details of that. All I can tell you was a very super relationship. My father saw in my mother this special lady and always put her up on a pedestal. She was great. They were great together. He was an outstanding. Any idea when when your parents got married? What year? Uh, 
Well, I have no idea how old he was, okay. but I would assume it was certainly in, in the lower 20s, age 20s. Okay, so dad becomes an accountant. Yes. And mom and dad get married. Herb was born in 1920. Well, I was born in 28, so he had to be born in 26, I would guess. And where were you living when you and Herb were kids? We lived on 18th Avenue and East 3rd Street in a beautiful, there were two family houses attached. We lived on, we owned the building. We lived on the first floor and it was a tenant above us. And uh, that was a great growing up time of uh, family units. All of the people on the block of East 3rd Street were all friendly. We knew everybody. We played with everybody. I mean, I can still remember thinking about playing ball, knocking it off the steps of the, of the house and trying to catch it, so we made a See, game but that's it. how Herb became a great uh, handball player. Herb boy, was a very good handball player. Okay, Herb was a great handball player. I Absolutely. remember playing ball with Herb uh, on the racquetball court and getting no points. I mean... He loved playing handball. I think that was his key sports, really. He didn't play many others, but... He, was, he loved handball. Now, you said to me when Herb was young, uh, Herb had curly hair? Oh, yeah. I almost didn't recognize it when he came home from the war. Of course, he had gone there. He had a full head of hair, curly hair. He came back. He had blotches of hair, but not a full cover head. And, uh, but all I can say is, I, to this day, I still miss him every day. Uh, we had a very special relationship. Uh, it would not be a week that go by that we would not have lunch, and it could be we could have lunch more than once in a week. Uh, I looked at him in terms of how he built a career for himself. My dad was a CPA. Herb didn't like being a CPA. He but Herb, but Herb that. became a CPA, I think. I don't know that he no, ever got he, a CPA he, degree. Herb, so Herb finishes high school. He started at Erasmus Hall, he said. Yes. Okay, and then, you, then the family and, moved to the Rockaways. And he finished up at Far Rockaway High School. Right, and then after that, he went to the he went to World War II. You said he was in the European campaign. He was with uh, what's his name? Patton. Patton went through Europe with that. Was lucky. He came home. He, other than the fact that he lost his hair, but he was a rock center of what was going on. Smart as a whip, hard worker, and uh, we just particularly as we got older, our relationship was he was absolutely my best friend and vice versa for him. Uh, anything that we had a problem in talking about, we could talk with each other. And I remember one time in the growing of his law firm and we're having lunch and he said, I'd like to know what you think. I'm having this problem at the firm. I says, Herb, why are you asking me about your law firm? He said, because I want to hear what you have to say. I want to lay out what I see and I want to hear how you think about it. And I thought about that and thought about that. We had a long conversation. And I walked out, A, feeling very powerful in my own mind that he would have thought I could be of some assistance in giving him an approach to the problem they were having at that time. But he built a law firm from my father's accounting practice with Dick Lieb was his partner. They had a double joint desk in my father's office. Dick was on one side, Herb was on the other, my father back in his big desk. And that's what he built from that firm to an unbelievable, talented firm that had an unusual reputation for what they stood for and how they did the kind of work that they did. And um, I know he passed away at age 81. And in my head, I say to myself, that was way too young. He still had so much more to give and to do his involvement in philanthropy in the Soviet Jew, the renaissance of bringing people out of Russia to save their lives. He traveled all over the United States uh, with um, Sharansky's wife in terms of having conferences in Washington and whatever with her until they got his release. Uh, and he was just very special. Let's get to your life a little bit. Okay, so you're born in 28, okay? The initial years were in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, public school, high school, in the Rockaways at that time, NYU. What were you going to NYU for? I was studying accounting, but I'm not sure it's what I really wanted. I thought 
it was a way, avenue I saw my dad do it and, and the kind of recognition that he'd gotten from people he worked with. But it really wasn't my style. I, I like direct communication better. And I thought that sales was a so better when spot did, for me. So when did you graduate NYU? I graduated NYU in 1946. So it's 1946. When did you meet Naomi? I met Naomi in high school at the age of 15. Naomi lived in? In, in Bell Harbor and Rockaway Beach and about three blocks away from where I lived. On my block was a cousin of hers that I was friendly with, and she had a party, she needed a date. She asked her cousin to come. As it turned out, he said, I'll only come if I can bring my friend Paul. And she used to pass by my house on occasion and hear me banging on the drums. And she says, you mean that jerk that plays the drums? That's how it started at age 15. I then started dating her, carried all the way through, through college. She stayed in New York, although she was accepted to go to a college out of town. She went to design school, Fashion Institute of Technology. In my senior year in college, I got married, so we had a honeymoon over the Christmas vacation. Uh, and uh, when I graduated, uh, my father-in-law asked me if I would come and work in their factory, not in the factory, but in the sales end of it, so they were manufactured ladies' lingerie. Where was the factory, down in the, the south? No, the factory was in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, our office was on 33rd Street and Madison Avenue. And I started working there and learning a little bit about what that all meant. I used to call on the chain stores and the buying offices in New York. And uh, it worked out fine. We, we had a couple of children. The third one was on the way. I said to my father, well, you know, I need to be able to make more money. He said, Paul, the business is for the children. I said, I understand, but I need more money now. And that never worked out, which caused a serious problem in the family. But I left the firm and went to work for another firm in the lingerie business, a little better me merchandise-wise. So you went to a competitor? Or? Well, it wasn't really a competitor. They made a little better line than what Venus Lingerie made. And this was Bel Air Lingerie. How many years were you with the family business? I was with the family business about six years. Uh, and as it turned out, one of the owners of that other one was a relative to my father-in-law. He was married to one of his sisters, which caused a huge disruption in, in the family. I understood that Naomi was caught in the middle of that, but I had to do what I had to do at this point in time. And I started to work at uh, Bel Air Lingerie, uh, doing better economically uh, than I was doing before. I asked whether or not there'd be any opportunity to become a partner in the firm, at which point they told me that was never going to be, they were not taking any more partners in. So I had a conference with my brother, and he said, Paul, I understand where that's at, I understand where your thinking is, but I met a couple of guys in the sales business called Life Insurance that I think are pretty talented guys and you want to meet them. Now, had you ever thought of the life insurance business? No, why would I think about that? I didn't, no, no way. I didn't have that any was, idea of was it. Was that alive still at this time or? Uh, my, my dad had actually passed away in between once I was at the Bel Air Lingerie. So uh, you meet these guys in the insurance business. The, yeah. The Marks Agency, was it? Yes, it was David Marks who was a major pension analyst uh, in the industry across the board, although he was a general agent for the New England Mutual. I met the guys at Herb New. I had an interview with the manager of the agency, Mark's agency, who was a real bull in a china closet, but he offered me a spot to come there. For $450 a month was my drawer. Your drawer, not your salary. My, my drawer. As an advance. Yeah. Uh, you had three at, kids at this time? Yes. Uh, we, we, at that point, we lived on Long Island uh, in Island Park. We had a nice little house. Uh, used to have nightmares about how I could meet all the expenses of keeping a house up, which I never had to realize or thought about before. But the reality behind it is 
it worked out okay. And so when did you go into the life insurance business? I went there in 1959, in March or April. Uh, I had a difficult time. I had a difficult time because you were trained to make cold calls to get appointments. So at night I would sit down at those days, we had the circular telephones that you would use. I would start to make a pitch to somebody that I just got connected with. And before I could get finished telling them why I was calling, they were hanging up the minute they heard life insurance. Naomi would go upstairs crying. And I did this for a while and I said, I gotta find a better way. This is not what I wanna do. And I started to figure out how do I get in the business community? My dad was a CPA. He recommended a couple of people I could talk to. I think I made one or two sales over there. I made a number of sales later on in my first full year in the business. I made what's called the million dollar round table. That sounds fantastic. You can't make a living on that. There wasn't enough money in it. But I continued with that and grew and I I really made a great success out of it. When did overtime. you build the, the Cronish Agency? In 1970, I became a partner with David Marks. I was approved by the New England Life Home Office. I succeeded him ultimately in 1972 and stayed there <clears throat> until December 31 of 1991. We had a great agency. We were number three or four in the country. Uh, and it was hugely successful. And we worked very hard at it. Uh, some of the stuff was difficult to get new young people to come into the business to make a living and to stay with that. But the reality behind it is we did this. I thought that Ben, who was in the business, and that's an interesting story because when Ben wanted to come in the business, I told him, I have a spot for you. You can't take any of my clients, but you can be a brokerage manager collecting and developing relationships with agents of other companies with product that you could learn better than what they had. And we had somebody tutoring him in this area. In his second or third year in that business, he headed all of the other agencies with operations working in the group market and as a matter of fact, since he was a great hockey fan, I made a plaque for him with three hockey pucks stuck in it. And I called it the hat so, trick so, for him. So let's talk about the family. The oldest is of your children. Stephen. So tell me about Stephen and his family. Stephen had, was, he was a great golfer. He was great from high school on. He got a job as an assistant golf pro at one of the clubs to support himself. At the end of the 12th or 13th year, he finally got a break and was told by a manager to pack his bags on Wednesday to leave on Sunday to go to Europe. They were shooting a film and they were not happy with the writer and they needed him because he had done some spec stuff. And uh, that was his break. He ultimately worked that thing one hour in front of the actually shooting and quote, couldn't get credit for it because he didn't have a screenwriter's guild membership. But he moved on, he met uh, David Cannell at that point in time. Cannell liked him, and he first showed, working with Cannell, was a film called Wise Guy. It was a show. It lasted for four plus years, and he moved on to several other things. Right, he had 24, he had the commission. Of the yeah. Him. Let's talk about your daughter. Laura, Lori went to Boston University. Uh, wanted to be a therapist. She got a master's degree and worked with children with emotional disabilities. She has a private practice here in New York City. Uh, and it used to be that the child, boy or girl, would be brought to an appointment with her, with their nanny. And finally, Lori said, this is ridiculous. The nanny has nothing to do with what's going on with this kid. Probably the nanny's giving them more love than the parents do. But unless the parent is willing to come with the child, we're not going to take them on. And so that's what she did and built that practice. Yes. And then, then there's Ben, who has been in business with you for all these years. Well, no, Ben was not in business with me up front. No, I mean now. Yes, Ben is with me over 30 years. Um, I think we probably only had two serious arguments that period of time. 
He is a very special guy who truly is a sweetheart to people. And when he works with them, he takes them whole family. Involved. Okay, and quickly, Herb has two, two children. Yes, David and Susan. Right. Uh, David moved to Israel, uh, had uh, five children. Susan was Susan. She was a high-strung young lady, very smart. Uh, we used to joke when she was going to go to Rochester, New York for a sales training course, and she was questioning me about how do you do this and what do you do. I said, Susan, you got to remember, when you get at the five-yard line, the next step is you got to get it across the goal line. That means you have to understand it doesn't always work out as being a successful interview when you're interviewing somebody on a sales process. But with everyone, you have to learn what it is you think you could have done better and how will you do it better in the future. So the good thing is about 35 years ago, or maybe longer, I had the great opportunity to meet two brothers, one who I consider like an older brother. Happy that I've been able to tell the story of the Kronish family. Thanks for well, being here. It actually was a very good experience for us as well, a very special relationship with somebody like you, and I appreciate this. Thank you.